Hello again, hope everyone is doing well. Today's video is going to be something a tad different, something that's indirectly connected to footy cards but not directly connected, and that is a bit of a ranking. So today I'm ranking the top 10 footballers for me who have debuted post-2000. And since I was young, I've always what liked doing these kind of lists, uh, analysing what the top players are and the legacies, uh, legacies they leave behind. And in that way, it is kind of connected to footy cards because generally the people with the greatest legacies are going to be the same people whose prices stack up in the future. But this is something I've been looking forward to doing for a long time and I finally put this together and I hope you enjoy. So I'm going to put up now who I see as my top 10 players since 2000. I'll chuck the graphic up now. So in this spreadsheet, I'm going to explain it a bit before I go through the players, but there's different columns. Each column uh, is a milestone or an award for that player. So AA, that's all Australian selections. BVT, that's Brownlow vote totals. So the total amount of Brownlow votes they've got during their career. Brown is Brownlow medals. Norm is Norm Smith's. MVP is the player's MVP. I think it's called the Lee Matthews Trophy now. Coleman is the Coleman medal. And then there's games played, goals kicked, and then the last column before the LPs is MVP in Brownlow year. So if the player had an MVP in a Brownlow year, I've taken off half the value of that MVP just because I don't want to double count one year too much. I don't want to have one a player having one outstanding sensational year. For example, Dusty's 2017 give them a huge amount of points um, because at the end of the day, longevity is also very important to someone's overall career. And then the last column is the accumulation of all these. So for each column, you get a certain, certain amount of points. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but for example, the All-Australian selection, I've allocated 0.35 points each All-Australian selection, and Brownlow vote totals, so I've divided that by 100. So if you've got, see Ablett's got 262, so uh, his point total for that is 2.62. And this kind of goes across. I've tried to do it evenly so that forwards um, and midfielders and to a lesser extent backmen, backmen, I definitely agree, get forgotten in, in these kind of lists. But to be honest, I don't see a backman in the top 10 players the last 20 years anyway. But I will be including some backmen later in the video for analysis. And I will be slightly changing the formula to include a more fair and representative um, point total for them. So if we go through the list from the top to bottom, you'll see that the LPs, I call them legacy points, uh, but they're not in complete perfect order. And that's because this is my top 10 before I even calculated this. And you can see it, it lines up pretty well. It's generally in the same order as what I've got them in. Uh, but for example, you've got Pendlebury in, in ninth place where I put him and then the LPs have him and actually uh, sixth place. So if there's one drawback in the system, I think players with very long, successful, consistent careers actually um, score higher in these points, such as Pendlebury, and players who are utilities or centre-half forwards, such as Rewalt and Pavlich, tend to be a bit underscored uh, in the totals, in my opinion. As you can see, Rewalt's in sixth in my overall tally and his points have him at ninth. So this process was really fun for me because I could go back and look at the actual stats and compare them to what my memory of those players were. So for example, Pavlich, he he's pretty much exactly stacks up to how I remember. Very long, consistent career, six All-Australians, lots of Brownlow votes for a forward, kicked 700 goals. But unfortunately for Pavlich, he didn't have much team success. Uh, as you can see in the Prem column, I actually think I missed that when I was explaining the columns, but the Prem column is the amount of premierships won, the team premierships won. Pavlich, he got in the grand final, but he ne never won a premiership, so I think this kind of hurts his legacy. Obviously, he never won a, a Coleman or a Brownlow MVP, Norm, any, in, any of that as well. So he has a very uh, consistent career, but he has no super, super special and legacy-making moments. And I just want to compare that to someone like Dusty, who Dusty has only got four All-Australians. And that kind of surprised me because you think of Dusty as one of the top, if not the top, uh, ultra-modern player since the 2010s or so. But he's only got four All-Australians and Dangerfield's got eight. So Dangerfield has got double the amount. However, if you look at Dangerfield, no premierships, no Norm Smiths, and Dusty has got three premierships and three Norm Smiths. So you can see that those big moments if you 
took finals out of the equation, Dangerfield would be much higher than Dusty. If Dusty never won those premierships and he just went on his normal season playing history, then Dangerfield would have a better career than Dusty. I'm, I'm very comfortable in saying that. And people may not agree with that because people have something against Dangerfield in his career, but you just can't argue with it. Eight All-Australians, only matched by Franklin and Ablett. He's got 230 Brownlow votes, which is the second highest on this list. He's won the Brownlow, he's won the MVP, which is in the same year as the Brownlow, so he gets some points taken off for that. 275 games, and he's kicked more goals than games played, so he's just had an unbelievable career. The other interesting point I want to make about this is it really clearly separates the top five players and the bottom five players. Ablett, Franklin, Dusty, Judd and Danger, and then the next five. So previous to doing the points, I thought someone like Danger and someone like Rewalt was very similar in Legacy, or someone like Danger and someone like Fife is very similar in Legacy. Uh, but the points kind of show uh, quite a big difference, mostly in the All-Australian selections and the Brownlow votes. So it shows Dangerfield has been great at a very consistent level, whereas someone like Fife, he's only got three All-Australians, but it, he's got two Brownlows and two MVPs, and one of those MVPs was in a non-Brownlow year. So... The three All-Australians he's got has pretty much, he's been the best player in the AFL for all those three seasons. So he's not just the top five player, he's been the best in those three seasons, which is quite interesting. Hodge, um, he comes in from a different angle as well. Only the three All-Australians, which is equal least with five, uh, but he does have the four premierships. And on top of that, he was a premiership captain. So I didn't factor that in, but that is an, an added bonus in my books um, for his career looking back and then of course two two norm smiths in those four finals is huge as well so for hodge if you stack him up against any other player in this list he doesn't compare individually but what he brings to the team he's the best leader out of this bunch by a mile and he's the most winningest player in this bunch so that's something to think about i didn't go through player by player but those comparisons should give you a pretty good idea and you can look at the list yourself and tell me what you think and tell me who would be in your top 10 and what I've missed out, whether you think the ranking system is fair or not fair, but I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comment section below. Next, I'm gonna quickly put up a list which is sorted by these legacy points and see what's different about it. So that should be up now. First of all, I didn't mention this before, but Ablett, he's above by over two. So before doing this, I thought Ablett, Franklin, Judd, and Dusty were the top four players by quite a distance, but between them, I didn't think there would be a huge amount of distance, especially between Ablett and Franklin. I see those as the two best players in this list, but there's two whole legacy points between them, and that's because Ablett won five MVPs, two Premiership, two Brownlows, and eight All-Australians, played over 350 games. He really had everything going for him, and this list and this calculation really shows that very clearly when you compare him to other greats of the era. Uh, but yeah, the only thing that changed in this calculation is that Pem Pendlebury went up, Rewalt, Fife, uh, and Hodge went down, and Pavlich is still in last position. But looking back, would I change my list at all? I think putting Judd up to three would actually be fair, especially because Dusty has some of his career to go. I'd expect Dusty to go past Judd and maybe even past Franklin by the end of his career. But at the moment, Judd probably uh, pips him, so I could change that. But otherwise, I think Rewalt and Pavlich are a bit hard done by by this point scoring system. Their greatness doesn't really show uh, as much as the other players, um, such as Pendlebury. Pendlebury's been extremely consistent, but I think Rewalt had a bit more star power than him in his peak. So the only thing I would change is putting Judd up one and Dusty down one. Okay, so in addition to my top 10 players, I also looked at a bunch of players which I thought their point, where their points sat would be interesting. These are all players that would be eligible for the top 10, i.e. players who debuted after 2000. And it's kind of interesting how they all stacked up. You've got Selwood at the top, that's Joel Selwood. Just like Pendlebury, Selwood and Swan below him as well show that the formula favours players who have long and varied careers and who are very consistent in their playing. So Selwood has the six All-Australians, Swan has the five. They both have very high overall Brownlow votes, which show that they were great over many seasons. They've both won premierships, Selwood's won the multiple premierships, and Swan's got the Brownlow and the MVP. And Selwood has played over 300 games and he's still going. Uh, personally, this was a tad surprising to see Selwood at 5.58, which would put him just below uh, Pendlebury in the top 10 by points. 
So that would put him in number seven. Personally, I don't see Selwood as a better player than Rewalt, than Fife, or even Pavlic. And Hodge, I think, at the moment, has a slightly better legacy as a team player because he's won the four premierships and he's got the Norm Smith. So I'd still keep Selwood off this list. Although, looking at his stats on paper, he's had a pretty formidable career. And also with Swan, I didn't even have Swan in the conversation of the top 10, but looking at his stats, he had a crazy good career, and especially only playing the 258 games. He was super consistent in that time, and he racked up a whole lot of Brownlow votes, so that's very impressive. Bartel, another uh, Brownlow medalist below them, very solid career once again, but only with the two All-Australians. I also looked at some Ruckman and Backman to compare against because I know most lists of the greatest and, and my list of the greatest is mostly uh, midfielders and also some key forwards. So for Ruckman, I looked at Dean Cox, who has a pretty high uh, points rating, and I changed the Ruckman All-Australian to 0.45 just because they don't get many points from other things. They, they're not very highly voted in the Brownlow, for example, so they just need a bit of an extra leg up, and it's, it's very impressive to get an All-Australian Ruckman because usually you only have two, and sometimes in some years I only have one specialist Ruckman. Similar for small forwards, I had Cyril and Betts, uh, that I calculated and both the All-Australians I bumped up to 0.45 instead of 0.35 just because I think it's pretty hard to get in the All-Australian team as a small forward and they both got in three times so uh, it should be shown in their points total. Betts is down there quite a bit, a 3.04 but you look at the names above him and it seems pretty fair really. Um, Cyril is a bit higher mostly because of his four premierships and I, I, once again I think that's fair. For the defenders, I've got Brian Lake and Alex Rance. I think most people would agree that Rance was a more individually brilliant defender and it was a better defender. But Lake, with the three premierships and, and the Norm Smith as well, just puts him over the edge slightly. And he got three All-Australians as well. So looking at the stats, it's pretty hard to say that Rance was a lot better than Lake uh, because Rance only won the one premiership, no Norm Smith, obviously, and only two more All-Australians. The other thing to note is that Rance only played 200 games, so if, if he had a longer career, he definitely would have uh, rose up in the ranks, in my opinion. I've got his Brownlow vote total at 20 highlighted, just because I don't actually know his Brownlow vote total. It was too low to be in the, in the list I looked at, and I couldn't really be bothered looking further than that. Moving on, I've also compared to some older players, which I thought would be interesting. In this list, I've got Adam Goods, Matthew Scarlett, Tony Lockett, and Lee Matthews. I probably should have included more 90s footballers like Rasheel and Buckley as well, but I can always do that in another video if people are interested. Uh, Goods, no surprise, is at 5.58. He debuted in 1999, I think, so he just misses out on this list. Otherwise, he would definitely be in there for me. He is a, a super special player that gets forgotten by history a lot. He won the two Brownlows and the two, two premierships, so yeah, he had some kind of career, and I think he deserves to be recognised a bit more in, in the football media today. For Scarlett, I think it fairly shows that he is the greatest defender of this modern era. Uh, with his points total at 4.63, which is quite a bit higher than both Lake and Rance, and would put him very close to Pavlich, actually. So I think that's a, a pretty fair total for him, and it would put him just outside the top 10. But he, once again, debuted before 2000. For the older players, we've got Lockett with his total at 6.83, which would put him in sixth place. And I think this really shows how great Franklin has been because even someone like Lockett, he got five All-Australians, he won a Brownlow, he won four Coleman's and he kicked over 1,300 goals. Yet Franklin's points total using this formula is still above his. And I was like, how does this make sense? Because Lockett's resume is so good. How does it make sense that Franklin's still above him? And then I looked at Franklin and he's got three more All-Australians two more premierships, and 50 more overall Brownlow votes, which is extremely impressive seeing as Lockett actually won the Brownlow, whereas Franklin hasn't really been close to winning one. He's just been playing well for that many seasons that he's racked up those numbers. And finally, Lee Matthews. I wanted to compare someone who is seen as the old GOAT, the greatest of all time, and compare him against Ablett. It's not really a fair comparison, though, because they didn't have the same All-Australian teams as, as the modern times, and they didn't have the same MVPs or... Uh, Norm Smiths as the modern times as well. So it's a bit of an unfair comparison. That's why Lee Matthews' points are so low. But for example, if 
but Lee Matthews won eight All Australians and won one Norm Smith, which I think is very reasonable to assume. He would be in the mid eights, so still below Ablett, but he would be second on the list, which once again I think is fair. This is where I got a bit carried away. I just wanted to look at some modern players as well, which was super interesting to me because I thought, well, if how far away are the modern players from matching or coming close to these top 10 and upper echelon players uh, from the past? And so I put together a bunch of newer players who are either midway through their careers or just starting their careers um, and check their point totals out as well. So first of all, no surprise, we've got the Bont at 3.86 which is a pretty crazy point total, seeing as he's just getting into his complete prime now and he's got a long way to go. I definitely see him as breaking into the top five in the future, probably dethroning Dangerfield for that fifth spot at least. And you, he's already got four All-Australians, he's already got an MVP and 130 Brownlow votes, which is just crazy. He might actually break Ablett's record for the most Brownlow votes of all time at this pace. Uh, other than that, if you go down the list, We've got some other big names at the moment. Gorn, he's a bit older than the other people on this list, so he doesn't have as long to bump these numbers up. But my projection is that he's gonna be like a Dean Cox stature. He might even have a slightly better career than Dean Cox at this rate. You can also see Paddy Cripps on this list, who is about to be overtaken by Petrak and Oliver, you'd think. And then if you keep going down, Nick Nat, I was surprised his points are that low. But if you look at his resume, um, he missed out on the Premiership. He only has three All-Australians and he doesn't really get Brownlow votes. So um, surprisingly, his legacy points are actually quite low in, in my books, whereas I definitely have him in my calculations um, on, the higher, on the higher ranks. So that is surprising. And the final two players are two ultra-modern players who haven't really had a chance to cement their legacy yet, but they have huge potential, and that's Sam Walsh and Darcy Parrish. And you can see Sam Walsh, although he's played nearly half the amount of games as Parrish, he's already surpassed him, and that's due to his Brownlow vote count. He had a super big count last year, and that's probably going to continue for the years to come. But the takeaway I get from this is that Sam Walsh, although he has all the potential in the world, his legacy points, if he retired right now, are still under one, which is crazy. That's below Sean Burgoyne, that's below Eddie Betts, that's below Travis Boak. Well, obviously, because these players have played five times the amount of games as him, and it just scares me that something happens to him, he's gonna be forgotten. He needs to have 10 times his career now to match uh, Gary Ablett or even get close to Gary Ablett. So overall, I thought this was an interesting experiment. Obviously, you have to take everything with a bit of a grain of salt. It's not gonna be perfect and all the scores, and I'm sure there's exceptions of players who have won five premierships but have been you know, relative nobodies who might have uh, quite an unnaturally high score. Uh, but in general, I think it's a pretty re reasonable formula to, to see how people's careers have gone and rank them against each other because it's always going to be hard. Everyone's going to have their opinions. I know I have my opinions. And if this can be a slightly more objective way uh, to rank players, then I think it's, it's a cool idea. So let me know what you think of the video and chuck your top 10 players below and I'll see you next time.